Welcome back to the FNZ Night Plus Free podcast, where free football supporters take a look into the dressing room, chat to former professional footballers about their experiences on and off the pitch. I'm your host, Ashley Simons. First of all, thank you for coming back to listen. We appreciate the support we've had of late. This venture has started really well and we are expecting to get more ex-pros involved for your entertainment. Make sure you let your mates know and also don't forget to leave a five-star rating. It makes it so much easier for us to get those players over the line. As always, let's start tonight with our introductions. I'm joined tonight by Armchair Andy and podcast recruitment king Mark Tuxford. How are we doing, boys? Yeah, all good. Yeah, not too bad. Good, good. Right, so let's start with Andy tonight. Um, Armchair, mate, what's that shirt you've got on tonight? This is uh, the famous Sierra Leone 2018-19 shirt when they nearly made it to AFCON. Um, just a little one I've, I've pulled out for Pat today. You just pulled it out, have you? Yeah, straight out of the bag. Straight out of the bag. Brilliant. Tux, you're in the pub again, mate. Where are you today? Yeah, uh, this time I'm in the wall pack. So I've done my pub tour of uh, the Albert Square, uh, Queen Vic. Where else have I been? I um, can't think where I've been. There. Rovers. You've been yeah. in the Rovers? Rovers return. And now in the wall pack of Emmerdale, Charity Dingle. Um, tonight we've had, a, I don't know where, I've, lo- I've lost myself, boys. I've lost myself. <laughs> Going well, we go? going well, Ash. Keep going, mate. Keep going. <laughs> it's going strong, isn't it? What's happening? <laughs> Who <are we> doing <laughs> Come on. Anyway, let's get back to it, boys. Right, so tonight, we have a former defender who has played in three out of four of England's professional football tiers. He's made 350 career appearances between League Two and the Championship over a 12-year career in professional football. It's Pat Baldwin. Pat, welcome to the show. How are you doing tonight, mate? I'm very well, thank you. Very well. Surviving in this weird and crazy times, but doing yeah. well, thanks, mate. Brilliant. Good to hear, mate. Uh, so let me set the scene for you. Just imagine you're in a pub, you've had one too many uh, one too many beers, and you're willing to share your whole career with three complete randomers. Is that okay? I wouldn't need to have too many beers to do that, mate, so no problem. <laughs> now, normally I'll pass you straight over to Tux, um, but tonight I think we should mix up a bit. Imagine we are in that pub, and in that in the bar, in the wall pack with Mark right now. And the barmaid comes over. She's like, what are you having, love? And Pat, what would be your drop, mate? What would be your drink? Well, you know, it, uh, I'd probably go for Guinness in a pub. If Come ever on. I'm in a pub, I have a few Guinnesses and then change over to a few shorts. But uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say a nice cold Guinness, mate. i tell you what, doesn't sound too bad. I've been off, been off Guinness for a couple of years now, but Tux, what are you going for, mate? Um... I think I might go for a pina colada, actually. A pina, pina colada? colada. Yeah, oh, sorry, boys, you caught me in the act there. Uh, yeah, I'll go for a Peroni while we're at it. Um, <laughs> armchair, what are you having? I do. I am uh, partial to a nice Pilsner, so um, I'll probably go for one of those. Yeah, lovely. I remember that night we had uh, a few Pilsners down at the football club. You remember that? That's every night, isn't it? Down there. <laughs> <laughs> How much do you reckon that round will come to? Well, if... well. Depends where we're at. I mean, in a, in a snazzy place like Woolpack, we're probably talking 10, 15 quid, aren't we, for four drinks? But um, whilst I'm paying, paying the bill, Tux, why don't you take over the questions, mate? Yeah, so Pat, uh, thanks again for joining us on tonight's no episode. Uh, firstly, can you take us back to where your love of football came from as a child? So whether that be going uh, to a stadium or watching games on TV, following a team uh, that, you, that you, know, you or your family supported, what did football mean to you uh, as a child growing up and what memories can you share with us? Um, the, the first memory I've had of football was I went to, um, I got taken along by my mum. I, I've got two older brothers and they were at a, um, I think it was like a, a Gary Lineker soccer school or something like that. I can't remember who was running it, but uh, they were getting dropped off there and I was going to be going with my mum and going home again. And um, the uh, the people that organising it just said, you know, does, does the little one want to join in? So my mum just left me there for the week. And I remember at that point, yeah, falling in love with the game and just uh, seemed to be a bit of a natural at it. I think I must have been about four or five. So like that. And that was the first moment I ever really remember of football. But the actual passion for it, um, I was taken to a Tottenham game, believe it or not. I'm a, I'm a West Ham supporter, so it won't, you know, I think it's the only time I've been. But uh, I remember going to the Tottenham game, my best pal and his dad. And I remember walking underneath the stadium, going to our seats. But in the walkway, you know, going there, every time we passed by the, the stairs, 
I could hear the roar of the crowd because we were running late as well. So I remember that was a vivid memory in my... And I've got a terrible memory, by the way. Awful memory, but there's little things. I only remember football things in my life. And that moment, I remember thinking, yeah, I, I like this. I, I think I'm going to try and have a bit of this. Yeah, so um, parts of your childhood have obviously inspired you to go on and have a career as you had as a professional footballer, uh, where we come on to the early part of your football education starting at Chelsea as a youngster. Um, what was it like coming through the ranks at such a big club like Chelsea? Um, yeah, it was amazing. I mean, I, I, I started off at Tottenham, believe it or not. Um, so I was there from about nine to 11. So I was at Spurs for a bit. And then there's about 10 you know, players in London that were quite sought after at the time. And we all got invited to go to Remember, this was just on the cusp where Glenn Hoddle was manager. And um, he was just bringing over Rude Hullet, that sort of um, era. I think it was just before that era. But there was just, you felt something was changing at Stamford Bridge. And I just I just thought, you know what, I, I like this. Um, and they also, my dad was out of work at the time. And they offered to, to um, give him a bit of money for scouting. So, I mean, the main reason was that, to be honest, because they helped us out a little bit financially. But um, I, I remember... Must have been about 11, yeah, 11, playing in a game at Stamford Bridge in the kit and just it just felt right. So there was about five of us that signed, ended up signing for Chelsea at the time. Yeah, so you obviously touched upon their uh, changes at Chelsea, uh, you know, throughout the years, throughout the decades, really. Um, so obviously Chelsea's a huge club with, you know, a multi-millionaire owner now. Um, you know, Roman Abramovich wasn't there during your time at the club. Uh, but it's, it's only recently that Frank Lampard has been one of the only managers to use the crop of talent available to him, which has obviously been largely down to, you know, financial regulations of late. Um, but, you know, what were your thoughts towards the club's youth policy during your time there? And obviously the years that followed with money to spend on big names and a lack of academy products coming through. Um, do you know what? I look back at my time at Chelsea with a lot of, um, with a lot of love. I love, I, I really enjoyed it there. Um, when I got released at 19, as hard as that was at that time, um, I had Robert Hoof the year below me coming through. I had John Terry two years above me. So I couldn't complain at all. You've got two, you know, well, John Terry, a world-class player. Robert Hoof established himself in the Premiership at a very good level, won the Premiership as well. Um, so, you know, at the time it was hard, but looking back, no, it was a great education for me. It was a great club. I was there for nearly 10 years, you know, from, from a very young age and released at 19, like I said. Um, I'll just look back with um, a lot of love. But, uh, yeah, not a lot of youth team players went through during the early stages, um, which, you know, made John Terry's journey even more exceptional. Um, with all that money coming in, um, you can't really argue because they, they won so much. Um, but it's, I really enjoy seeing Frank Lampard doing well, A, because he's, you know, such a, a legend, isn't he, in the game, what a player. Um, but he comes across as a really good, good manager you'd want to want to work for, and the crop of young lads they've got, it's um, it's really good to see. Um, the the head of youth there, Neil Neil Bath, has um, used to coach me as a kid, so to see all those players coming through and him being the head of that, it's uh, it, yes, yeah, it makes me pr uh, proud of uh, of Bath. He's done really well and deserves that sort of success. Yeah. So how difficult was it not to? get an opportunity at, you know, at a club like Chelsea, you know, going to make a, you know, first team appearance and things like that. And obviously you were there for a considerable amount of time, but how disappointing was it not to actually get on that field? Uh, it was disappointing. I came close. I was on a bench in Europe once when, um, I don't know, I guess you guys are a little bit too young to remember, but the, a load of the um, first team has refused to travel to Israel because of security fears. So I kind of got called up last minute. I had a chance of starting, but they ended up starting um, a young a lad, a couple of years younger than me, um, which turns out, I was talking about it today, weirdly. I was talking about it to one of my mates who sent me a link about, there's a bloke called Gwyn Williams there, who was general manager at the time, and Joel Kitmerich, who was the young lad who played, he was kind of his boy um, that he brought through, was set to, you know, financially gain from his making his debut, so it's it's kind of hard now knowing that, that that went on, that that was in the way of my debut. But, um, you know, that's just football. You have to accept that. It's a, it's a, a ruthless game. Um, and I was distraught at the time when I got released. I was absolutely distraught. But um, 
going back home, playing with my mates. I went on a dole for a bit because I was out of work. So picking up the dole, just playing football most nights at, um, you know, five-a-side, uh, power league stuff with my mates. Just That completely changed everything for me. I went back to enjoying the game um, and got back in, fortunately, had a couple of trials and one of them came off at, at Colchester United. Um, I had a good, tri- good trial there and ended up there for quite some time as well. So, Pat, you joined Chelsea after their success in the FA Cup and the Community Shield. Did you ever expect them to become the dominant Premier League side that won five titles between 2004 and 17? Um, You could kind of feel it. When I was there, they started to have success. Like you said, they won the FA Cup and and things like that at the time. Um, And you could feel it. The players, the the calibre of players that were coming in at the start of when I was there, the kind of, the rude hullet kind of started the foreign influx. Um, and after that, Rude Hullet himself signing Viali, Zola, Di Matteo, Frank Leboeuf, kind of that, that sort of era. You could feel that they were in the in the right, well, taking the right trajectory. Um, uh, and you, you kind of, yeah, I kind of did expect them to to be successful. And then, obviously, when Roman Abramovich came in with his money, that was in the early stages of when you know sh- stupid amount of money were being pumped into football. He was kind of one of the first chairmen, wasn't he, to invest so many millions. So. Yeah, you could kind of expected it once he took over. Um, but yeah, you could you could sense it when I was there towards the end. You could sense that they were heading in that direction. So obviously, after you left, so you left Chelsea and you just you briefly went over it there. But you you went into a period where there was no opportunity at Chelsea to to go out on loan or anything like that. Um, to be honest with you, at that time I was kind of I was in the youth team, captain of the youth team. Um, and then went into reserves, captain for the reserves for a bit. But I kind of, I found the the step up. I was a bit of a late developer physically. And I found that step up from youth team to reserves quite hard at the time. Um, being 19, I hadn't fully developed. And you had, you know, like a Terminator in Robert Hoof, um, younger than me. He was huge, even at a young age. And um, I found that step up quite hard, to be honest. Um, and I struggled a bit physically. So... Whether I was ready to go out alone and play men's football at the time, I don't think so. Um, and like I said, I need, I think I needed to kind of go away, play my mates. Uh, and I'm sure you guys have played five-a-side, um, you know, five-a-side in London. It was quite ruthless. So that toughened me up a little bit more. I'm not saying I was, you know, a fairy or anything, but I was certainly not quite ready for men's football. But that summer was a, was a real turning point for me in my career. It kind of got the love of the game back and and turn me a bit more determined and physical. And that helped me when I went on trial at, um, you know, first team clubs uh, like I did with Colchester. So just before you left Chelsea then, would you say that there were any players that had an actual positive impact on the way that you played football going forward? Was there anyone you looked up to or anyone that you were your peers with that made a positive impact on your career? Uh, there's loads of players. I mean, I'm, I'm an... I like to think I'm an open-minded person. I, I, I try and learn off everybody, whether that's an older pro, whether that's someone just starting out, or whether that's someone younger than me. You can always learn from from anybody. And um, yeah, there was there was loads at Chelsea. Jesus, I was I was very spoiled. I had you know Marcel Desailly at the time, Frank Leboeuf, World Cup winners, um, John Terry just on the start of his career. But you know, from a very very young age, you could t- tell how good he was and how hard he worked after training and technically how gifted he was. So I had all these players. And, and again, Robert Hoof as well. From from a very young age, you could tell that he was going to be some player. So I had I had loads of players that I could uh, learn from. And, and yeah, I was, I was very, very lucky and fortunate to have had that at that stage of my career. And, and I also had two amazing youth team managers at the time, one called Jim Duff, who was a kind of old school centre-half, um, came you know, did well up in Scotland. He really kind of turned me from a, a, a bit of a wet fish teenager to to the, the start of being a, becoming a you know a man. And Steve Clark, who's now um, Chelsea uh, Scotland manager, um, he was fantastic for me as well. So I was, I was just really lucky. Looking back, I couldn't have had a kind of better start and better foundations uh, put in for me. Really, it's good to hear. So obviously, you went on to after a successful trial at Colchester United, you actually joined Colchester. Um, tell us about <clears throat> tell us about the situation you found yourself in and, and what happened when you joined them. How did it come about? 
Um, well, I was at, I had an agent at the time. I had several agents. Kind of, I was, I was playing one against the other. Whoever would get me a club, basically, or, or a trial. Um, several agents were giving me opportunities, and there's, I think it was Luton Town and Colchester at that time at the start of pre-season um, invited me in for a trial game, um, and going into trial without kind of having a pre-season with a team is quite tough. So I did a pre-season on my own, um, pretty much with a little bit of help from my dad, kind of pushing me on his on his bike, bless him. Um, yeah, went on trial at, at Colchester. And like I said, with that five-a-side playing throughout that summer as well with my mate, so I was pretty sharp and fit. So I went into the trial um, at a, you know, physically at a good stage. I was a little bit more fit than the other players at Colchester at the time. So I kind of stood out from, from that sense, from a fitness point of view. But um, yeah, I just had that confidence back and a self-belief and, and I, I kind of um, stood out, I think, amongst the other trialists and, and fortunately... Um, was offered, offered a contract uh, on the, the first day of my trial, which was really good. Well, you set me n- up nicely for our, um, our next question, to be honest, and talk about standing out. Um, Pat, many people fail to crash their car once in a lifetime, right? <laughs> you only went and done it twice in one day on your way I to did, training. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've picked up a newspaper report from September 2002, and it, it, this is what it said. It said, the incidents happened as Bold, Baldwin travelled from his South End home to training on Monday, but the defender was back in training on Tuesday and is hoping to play in the, against Coventry in the Worthington Cup on Wednesday. I'm fine, Baldwin told the club's official website. I was a little shocked, but if the, if the manager gives me the call against Coventry, I'll be good to go. The first incident was a bump from behind and the second saw Baldwin's vehicle skid across a roundabout and collide with a minibus. I mean, come on, please tell me, was this some kind of, uh, you know, attention-seeking event where you could get into the squad or what happened? No, uh, do you know what? I was late for training that day and it was absolutely teeming down and I was, I was, you know, 19 or whatever I was. Um, I was driving a flipping KA. It was like a go-kart. And, uh, <laughs> well, it was a car. It was a, it was a terrible car. But I loved it. And um, I was late for training, and that's why I skidded around the roundabout. It was, it, my crash wasn't actually in the roundabout. That was the bump. But the actual um, crash, I mean, I got banned from driving for it, so it's not really that funny. I was, it, was a, it was a serious smash. I wrote my car off, yeah. And, um, so, you know, trying to get to I training. Mean, I mean, you probably did yourself a favour. It was a KA, mate. So you, you, you learnt your lesson yeah. there. I downgraded though if you can do that I did that I had to downgrade <laughs> because of insurance reasons after that but uh, well that's yeah, that, you, look you're setting me up here tonight mate because that was my uh, my next question what were the insurance premiums like after that shocking shocking I had to go on my, I think it was like a name driver on my dad's insurance and I yeah. had to get a, a car with an immobiliser if you if you've ever heard of one of those yeah when I was a kid. Um, like that back in the day, mate. I can remember back, doing that myself. Back in the day. So, yeah, it was, it was um, even that on my dad's insurance was shocking, but it needed to be done. I was stu- it was stupid. It was stupid. I do regret that. We're on to a really juicy bit of your career now. Uh, so, I think many fans will remember you fondly from your time at Colchester United. Um, I myself are from the Colchester area. Um, and I think many fans, support, right? You're an yeah, yeah, well, yeah. I'm an Ipswich fan, but yeah, from culture stuff. But yeah, <laughs> um, I think many fans obviously see you as a bit of a, a cult hero to this day, um, especially playing your part in that in that season. The team won promotion to obviously the championship, um, and then celebrating at Yeovil on that last day. Uh, that was quite fond memories. Um, would you say that that was one of the highlights of your career? Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean. There's not many times in your career, um, you know, when you start out, you take your career for granted. But then, you know, with hindsight, there's not many times in your career you kind of play on a team um, where everything just seems to click and you're successful and everyone gets on regardless whether they're starting or not. Um, Good competition, but just a real good bunch of lads. And that was what we had at the time. And I I, I don't think I ever really had it after that at other clubs, to be honest. um, so yeah, I was just really lucky to kind of uh, been in amongst the, some some fantastic football players, and and I was just lucky to kind of uh, tag along and just do my little job on the pitch and and let the other ones, you know, all the ones with with a lot of talent go and shine, mate. To be honest. Yeah, I think you played more than your part there. Obviously, you had um, I think it was partnership with Wayne Brown. I think it was at the time, wasn't it? 
Uh, yeah, well, there's, there's Brownie and, and uh, a lad called Leon Chilvers as well yeah. that we, we played a lot of games together. And he, he was a, well, his nickname was The Rock. He was fantastic. But Brownie, what a leader. Um, yeah. you know, uh, ugly as sin, but what a leader. What a leader <laughs> he was. And he's doing well in management now. So it's, it's fantastic to see. Yeah. Um, so that first season, you know, there was a great team spirit, as you, you know, just touched upon there amongst you all, uh, narrowly missing out on the, on the playoffs and a final game against Sunderland. Uh, which will live long in the memory as well. But alongside alongside you there was obviously, you know, like you say, uh, Brownie, uh, Chilvers. Um, you know, you had players such as like Carl Duggan, who's a, a legend there, Kem Ezzett, Neil Dans, Chris Rulamo, and Jamie Curitan. You know, there's many more as well. Um, these players are very much in Coach United folklore. Uh, what, was, what was that season like for you personally? And, you know, obviously playing at that high level for you in the Championship. Uh, the championship years were fantastic, especially that first year. Like you said, we just narrowly missed out on the playoffs, which was, um, you know, crazy at the time because we were such a we're, we're a small club in League One, let alone going up to the championship. So, um, you know, I just remember um, having such freedom for the from the manager George um, Williams at the time, Grant Williams, as as you you would know from Ipswich. Um, just a fantastic. Um, man management allowed us to go out and play how we wanted to play he gave us a little bit of structure but we had the players that were intelligent enough to kind of deal with most situations and, and our form at home was what carried us really um, none of the big teams like to come to Lair Road um, and it was just yeah just the, the most enjoyable probably the most enjoyable year of my football life really um, you've got success at a decent level playing against some very good players and clubs um, yeah you just, you just look back now with pride like I said you take it for granted when you're playing but looking back now you know I'm, I'm proud of, to have been a part of that uh, that team and contributed um, as much as I could yeah so how much of an advantage was uh, Lair Road to you and in those those kind of seasons especially you know as I say playing teams like Sunderland who are massive and uh, you know coming to little Lair Road and you know how much of an advantage was that for you guys personally to you know it was, it was huge it was a massive advantage and it was a, a fairly condensed pitch as well and, and it kind of suited how we wanted to play we played with high tempo we had big Chris uh, Iwaluma up front who just bullied defenders for fun with Jamie Curitan who's one of the best finishers you know outside of the premiership at the time he's uh, you know a fox in the box if you like and um, it was yeah it was just it was it was everything it was the old Run down stadium where the you know big players at big clubs would not have enjoyed coming to. Um, the fans were fantastic. The the atmosphere on the, um, especially the evening games as well was just incredible for such a small place. I think it's where the the, the stands were right next to the pitch and um, the fans could get into the opposition players' heads and it's just a really enjoyable place to play football at the time. Yeah, so I mean you look at Coach United now. I've seen. League Two, as it currently as we currently speak, but um, having been at Lay Rose and then moving into a, a newish sort of stadium, ten thousand capacity. I mean, do you think that's been, been kind of in a way, but detrimental to their to their progress? I think um, the proof is in in how they've done over the since they've moved there. Um, it has been detrimental, but it was a move that had to happen for progress and and for their future financially and everything else. I think the. The chairman's invested so much money, uh, Robbie Cowling, um, trying to trying to play the right way, trying to promote uh, youth in the right way. So as a club, I think he's done fantastically well. But when you're kind of um, investing in youth, um, it's, it makes it really hard to get success because you need a good mixture of experience. And they've they've tried that, and they're still you know they're, they're there or thereabouts at the moment, aren't they? This season, yeah. Um, the manager there has done really well. Um, but uh, I think, yeah, it has, it, it's taken something away from the club, I think, where you had a real kind of family, close-knit feel about the place. And then you went to this big corporate stadium that we could hardly ever feel um, had a massive impact. Yeah, definitely. Um, so obviously, as I said earlier, you know, cult hero status at Colts United and then, you know, going on to play for South End United, which obviously are their biggest rivals. Um I mean, what was the decision behind that move and did you receive you know, much backlash from that? Um, to be honest with you, that was probably before social media, which I'm kind of glad about. So I didn't have to deal with any of that rubbish. 
Yeah. Um, you know what? No, I didn't come across anything. I think it's probably because I'm quite a private person and and stay away from that sort of stuff. Um, just kind of play football and go home to my family. Um, no, I, I was I was quite lucky, and Southend fans were fantastic, especially my first period there. They were they were amazing, um, but at the time, without go, kind of going into it, because you know there's no point. But um, I think re- I wasn't really left with much choice at the time with uh, the, the manager that I was playing under at the, uh, then. So I just wanted to get out and play football. My mum and dad lived in Southend, so it was a huge that was a huge influence on me that. I was able to nip in and have a cup of tea with my mum after training and stuff. So it was a no-brainer for me. I mean, all of this rivalry business, you know, that's for the fans. It's not for players. I've got to go. It's a job at the end of the day. I have to go and do what's right for myself and my family and my career. Yeah, definitely. I mean, so your time at Southend, I mean, what were your kind of highlights there? Did you enjoy your time at the club? I got relegated the first time I went there. So that weren't great. And uh, the second time... Um, I wasn't fit enough. I came back from injury. Uh, I just wasn't fit enough. Um, they were vying for promotion at the time. Paul Stark was manager. Uh, and like I said, I just wasn't fit enough. So I didn't really contribute at the time there uh, as best as I should have done and could have done had I been more fit. Um, but no, it was a lovely club. It was, again, it was, it was run by decent people. The fans were always good to me and my family. Um, so, yeah, I, I look back on fondness, but not the kind of successful memories that I had at Colchester but you know nice memories nonetheless but after Southend you moved on to Exeter City what was your how did that move come about and and you know how how, how was that move again for you uh, it came about, like I said, I was at Southend at the time and I wasn't playing. I wasn't even making the kind of first, uh, the, the squad. I was travelling and so I was getting frustrated at the time. Um, and I got a phone um, and I got a phone call from Steve Perriman, who was uh, involved at Exeter um, with Paul Tisdale there. And he, he just rang up and said that um, Danny Coles, who was centre half at the time at Exeter, had, had damaged his back quite badly. They were looking for a centre half, and Danny Coles, I'd played with at Bristol Rovers, he recommended me to to the management team, and they just rang up and asked me whether I'd be fancy coming down to Exeter. And so, at the time, like I said, I wasn't playing at, at South End. I thought, you know, and it was a step back up into League One. So after a brief conversation with my uh, my my wife, um, it was a kind of from from a career point of view, it was a no brainer. I had to I had to really go to try and get some games. Yeah, and I mean you played seventy odd games for Exeter. So other than than Colchester, that's that's kind of the the second highest in your career. They must the, the, are, are they up there in terms of Colchester level um, of how much you enjoyed yourself. Um, like I said before, you, you very rarely do you get a, in a changing room as uh, a successful changing room. So to compare them is quite difficult because it's a different stage of my career as well. Mm. Um, in terms of the feel in a changing room, though, there was only you know one clear winner and one clear period in my career, and that was Colchester. But in terms of at the time of my career, the time stage of my life, um. It was it was a fantastic club, Exeter. I mean, I've I've settled down this way, so that that speaks volumes of how much I've enjoyed living down here. Um, the club itself were is really well run, um, owned by the fans, uh, and just a lovely, lovely kind of family club. And and that's where I kind of I've always felt quite comfortable with being at, at, at clubs like that. Yeah. So so. After Exeter, what what was what was your next kind of move in your career, um, and and what, what what were your thoughts behind that next move? Um, well, from Exeter, I I got a bad knee injury at the time. I, I suffered from quite bad injuries throughout my career. Um, I, I could have probably played double the amount of games if it wasn't for injuries. Um, so the more I started to get injured, the more you have to think about your future and your you know, life after football. And, and I'd seen a lot, of, a lot of close friends suffer from, you know, going out of football and, and falling into depression, getting divorced, um, you know, some to the brink of suicide, that sort of stage. And I always thought from a very kind of fairly young age that I wasn't going to do that. I wasn't, I was never going to put myself in that position. I, I owed it to my wife and my family to prepare for life after football. So, 
even when I was at, at uh, Colchester, I started, I went back to school, did my A-levels. Um, um, when I moved to Exeter, I was in my A-levels. And then whilst at Exeter, I did a degree. Um, and so I kind of, once I did my knee in, I was, it, was, it was just a bit weird timing that um, I came to the end of the, the degree and I had a choice whether, right, if I don't get offered a contract because the season was up, I've been out the whole season with my knee, do I travel up and down the country trying to find a, a year uh, here or a year there or do I decide, you know what, let's just take the plunge. So I decided once I wasn't offered a contract to Exeter, I decided to, to go into teacher training and um, you know, take the financial hit for the year. Uh, and then I ended up signing for Weymouth out of a, a chance meeting, at, um, a coaching course with a Weymouth player. Um, put me in touch with his manager, and I just signed for a bit, of, a few hundred quid a week to play on a Saturday, basically, and to get me just to contribute to the, my teacher training year. And so I had a bit of savings to fall back on as well that helped us. And and yeah, and so trying to be a teacher, and now uh, that's what I'm doing now. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. When I you know, I was doing my research, you, you kind of, you, you discover a lot about people, what they do after, what they do after football when they retire. And it's nice to see you've done, you've done something proactive and, and you've gone out there and, and you've got your degree and, and you're kind of in that stage of almost giving back. And, and yeah, how, how are you, how are you finding teaching? Um, there's the huge elements that are amazing that um, you kind of uh, a job satisfaction that is hard to describe you know helping these kids I work in a school in a, in a fairly deprived area um, so you know some of the kids are, are from tough backgrounds but from that point of view massively rewarding there's elements of teaching that I won't even get into that that could improve you know all the paperwork and the politics of it but I guess that's, you get that in it in, in most industries so um, from a from a job satisfaction point of view, yeah, it's, it's incredible working with these kids. Um, but uh, the main reason why going into it was that uh, football coaching and management is such a precarious industry that I didn't want to put my family in that, you know, uh, at all at any risk. So I, I kind of went with a stability of teaching and, and don't regret it at all. Um, completely walking away from football was a, a quite a tough decision at the time, but Looking back now, the amount of time I get to spend with my kids down here in, a, in an amazing part of the country, it's, uh, you know, I've, I've got no regrets at all. I was glad I did it for now. Whether I'll go back to football, who knows? Um, but uh, for now, I'm, I'm happy with, uh, with, with my life. Pat, you didn't score many goals in your career. I'm sure Andy will tell you he could count them all on one hand. He's yeah. famous for that saying. Would you say you were more of a clean sheet man than you were a goal scorer? Oh, absolutely, yeah. No, I kept quite a few clean sheets, but I was more of a diversion because I was 6'3". People would expect me to be good in the, air, in the air, but I was just naturally not good. It was, it was actually my biggest weakness, which was stupid playing at centre-half, but I was lucky enough that managers kind of saw my other attributes of kind of reading the game and playing, playing out of the back um, and putting a kind of head on a stick like a Wayne Brown next to me that did all the, the ugly work and... I just mopped up and looked quite stylish next to him. So, um, yeah, I wasn't. My timing was was atrocious, and I was terrible in the air. Terrible. So, what you're saying is you were more of a Rolls Royce kind of player than you were. You I'm know, not saying that because that I, I would have been playing in a prem if I was Rolls Royce. <laughs> but I was, you know, a decent, full focus. You know, I was I was all right. I was all right. Reliable, very yeah. reliable. Yeah, yeah exactly. You're like, Andy, you've got a forward focus, haven't you? No, uh, not that level yet. A fiesta, mate. But picking up on that point by you, Pat, you know, you stand there and look good. I feel that's what I'm doing here at the moment with it, with these other two. Uh, you, you're all doing all right. You're all doing all right. Don't worry about that. Oh, Andy, you had to throw that in there, mate. That's only your third interview, Andy. I think we've done, how many have we done now? Ten? I mean, you know, you're getting better, mate. You're getting better. No, I'm you're sure. good. You're doing really good. I've had a lot worse, I can tell you. <laughs> it's definitely the shirt that's letting you down tonight, Andy. Um, oh. Pat. <laughs> Final question. We ask this to everyone that comes on the channel and we've been looking to get this player on and uh, we just cannot find him. And I mean, it, it's, we're, we're going out on a whim here, but have you ever played against or with Deli Adebola? Deli Adebola? No, I have not. No, I have not. Another one, boys. Another one. Search goes on. 
the yeah, search he had goes a on. Do you know what? I think he uh, did. He get me a car once. I think he may he may have sourced a business in sourcing cars, and he got me a car. Was it Deli Ali Bowler? Oh my god! Wow. I don't know. I can't remember. So are you saying yeah. that he's more of a Del Boy kind of icon in the football world that we're not aware of? Jelly I, I, don't, I might be being mixed up with someone else, to be honest. Um, Del Boy and Ebola. Yeah, yeah. maybe. I don't know. Good luck <laughs> with your search. Good luck with your search because I've got no one <laughs> in my address book. Come on, we've got to find the boys. Look, I think we should say now it's about time for our hashtag find Adebola because if we don't, anytime soon, it's going to get embarrassing. Give I it mean, a go. Give it a go. Episode boy. 10. Pat and we we still have find him and I, I said to the boys at the start I said if we don't get him by episode 10 we might as well pack up but you know there's no chance of that happening now <laughs> we're definitely going, if you, you know you've, you've got you're getting some decent players on keep going boys you're doing all right yeah <laughs> brilliant self plug there yeah self plug there just throw, throw yourself in there right Pat it's been brilliant oh, no, I didn't mean that I didn't mean yeah. that I mean <laughs> other players I see he you he retracts no he retracts no Pat you've been brilliant mate it's been it's been good to hear from you tonight no and uh, whatever happens in the future take care and good luck alright you too boys stay safe take care thanks Pat cheers, cheers mate cheers, cheers lads